Okay, well, I make it 11.30. Uh, let's, uh, let's get started on our webinar today. So uh, welcome to everybody who's, uh, who's joined us. Um, this webinar, uh, as the title suggests, is all around living together. And we're joined today by Sergit and Helen from Palmer's. Uh, and I'll leave Sergit to in introduce, uh, introduce herself and Helen to you shortly. Just a couple of housekeeping issues. Um, we will have a uh, hopefully an opportunity at the end of the session today to take some of your questions. Um, on your Zoom toolbar, you'll see the Q&A button. If you open that up, it will open up the uh, Q&A box for you, which will allow you to put your questions forward um, to either Serge or Helen. So please feel free to do that as we go along today, and we'll try and get uh, to answering as many of those live um, at the end. Uh, we are also recording um, this webinar, so an on-demand version will be made available on our website later today. So if there's anything you've missed or want to recap on, um, then we'll let you know when that's live. Um, so we're scheduled to run for about 45 minutes this morning. Um, so without further ado, I will hand over to uh, Sergit. Thank you, Joe. Um, good morning. Um, I'm Sergit Birdie um, and I specialise in family law and I'm joined by Helen, who is a private client solicitor. So what I specialise in is divorce, separation, financial work, children matters, cohabitation, which I'm going to be talking about today, prenuptial agreements and cohabitation agreements as well. Um, with more than a third of marriages ending in divorce, there can be no surprise that more and more people are marrying for a second time or embarking on cohabiting relationships after their divorce. There is the impact of those second marriages and cohabiting relationships on money and fi finances can be complicated and difficult to navigate and there are a different rules applying in different circumstances. So today I'm going to be talking about the common law husband and wife, how a property can be held securely, and then I'm going to be going on to cohabitation agreements and prenuptial agreements. So the first question to ask, is there such thing as a common law husband and wife? And this is a frequently asked question, and the simple answer is no, this is a myth. Um, cohabitation is a term used to describe a couple who live together and what we need to remember is that these relationships don't have the same recognition in law as a married couple. And a common misunderstanding is that the couple will have established a common law marriage after being together for a period of time. This is not the case. And very often moving in is a happy experience, but practicalities such as whose name is on the property, who's going to be paying the mortgage payments are often glossed over until it's too late. Those individuals can fall into the living together trap. And what I mean here is that one party owns a property and the other party lives there without having an interest in the property, but mistakenly thinks that they will acquire an interest the longer that they live together. And that's far from the truth. So I'm moving on to a case study and the um, I, I'm using a couple called John and Jill. Um, with this couple, John purchases a house um, in his sole name. He purchases it using a deposit made up of his own money, a mortgage, um, and he starts to live in this house. A year later, he meets Jill in a pub and they begin dating. To begin with, he stays at hers and she stays over at his property, but they're not living together. Jill is living in a one bedroom flat and after 12 months, they decide that it's pointless that Jill's spending so much money renting when she's spending lots of time at John's house. And Jill gives up her flat and moves in with John. They live together for a period of four years and unfortunately they then break up. When they were living together, all of the bills to the house were in John's name and Jill had a cat and the cat moved in with them and she bought, she bought the cat food and dealt with all those bills and she'd pay for meals out, weekends away and occasionally purchase food and household items. Um, there was no specific conversations about who would have an interest in the property. So after four years of living together, you ask yourself, does Jill have, a, have an interest in this property? And the answer is no, she does not have an interest in the property. Um, the ownership of any assets is decided by property law um, rather than rather than how, how it's dealt with, with divorcing couples. So if your name's not on title deeds, you would not be entitled to anything. So here, Jill would not be entitled to anything. There are certain ways which you can establish an interest, which I'll talk about later on. Is a position any different for married couples? Um, 
yes, it is different for married couples. And if John and Jill had been married, the answers would be very different. With married couples, when you separate, the starting point is equality, irrespective of whose name is on the title deeds. And there are various factors which are looked at um, when determining whether there should be departure from 50-50. But what doesn't matter if you're a married couple is if it's held in one party's sole name, if you acquired an interest by virtue of the marriage. However, that does not arise with cohabitees and cohabitee and their interests is determined in accordance with the law of trusts. So who has an interest in a property? What is an interest in a property? An interest in a property is the term used when your name is on the title deeds of a property. And this is a legal interest. I'm also going to be referring to the term beneficial interest. And this is your name is not on the title deeds when you have a beneficial interest, but you can you have an interest in the economic benefit of the property. And I'll talk later on about how you acquire a, a beneficial interest in the property. So going back to um, John and Jill, and had they decided to purchase a property together, they can hold the title in one of two ways, either as joint tenants or tenants in common. Now with joint tenants, you own the property as a whole. So you, it, you, you own this in and you have equal rights to the property. And if either of you dies, the property automatically goes to the other co-owner and you can't pass on your ownership of the property in your will. However, if you hold the property as tenants in common, you each hold a certain share of the property. So if you were to split the property in half, one of you would own one half and one of you would own the other half. So you can own different shares of the property and that property doesn't automatically go to the other co-owner upon death. This can be passed on um, in, in a will. So you would pass on your share in your will. Um, so if John and Jill held, held the property as joint tenants, um, they would hold it as a whole. And in the event of either party's death, it would pass to the other party. But this wouldn't be the same with tenants in common. And you would make a will and it would pass to whoever is named in your will and wouldn't automatically pass. So where I talked earlier on about um, Jill living in John's property, but she didn't have an interest, there are ways in which you can acquire an interest in a property. Um, when it's held in someone's sole name. The first of those is an express trust. So with an express trust, you'd say, you'd look at whether John had actually had a conversation with Jill to say that he was holding property for both of them, despite it only being in his sole name. If you are to rely on an express trust and you are in court proceedings, you have to be very specific in your evidence about those conversations and when they took place and it is going to come down to the evidence that the parties give in respect to those conversations and whether there was any express agreements between the parties. Um, there's an implied trust where you look at how the parties conducted themselves and this is broken into re resulting trust and constructive trust. A resulting trust is when a party makes a direct financial contribution to the acquisition of a property. So a direct contribution can be a payment towards a deposit, mortgage payments and renovations. And when I'm talking about renovations, I mean quite substantive renovations. Not It wouldn't include like decorating um, and a resulting trust wouldn't, would also not include contribution to bills, shopping etc so if Jill had been making direct contribution towards the mortgage she could say that she has an interest in the property but again it would be up to her to be able to show that she had made that contribution allowing her to have an interest in that property if she can't rely on a resulting trust or a direct contribution she can rely on a constructive trust and this is again any conversations that took place between the parties or let's say she took she took full control of managing a renovation project she could say that she she's acquired a beneficial interest through her input into that property the other the other point is proprietary estoppel where one party is led to believe that they have an interest so a representation is made to that party giving the non-owning um, party an interest and there's a reliance on that representation that's made um, i mean it, it, an example of this was Jill gave up her tenancy and she relied on um, moving into John's property and acting, acting upon that, thinking that she had an interest 
in that property. It is extremely challenging to, uh, to establish an interest in a property where it is solely owned. It's a long process um, if a court application does need to be issued and it should be issued with extreme caution. What Jill should have thought about in these circumstances is whether she should have had a cohabitation agreement drawn up. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about cohabitation agreements and Helen will be talking to you a bit more about declaration of trusts. So a cohabitation agreement, what is it? It's a written agreement which is signed in front of witnesses and it deals with the principal areas which are who owns what at the time of the agreement and in what proportions. Um, it also includes what financial arrangements you've decided to make while you are living together and how property and assets and income should be divided in the event of your separation. Um, it's important to bear in mind that a cohabitation agreement should comply with the basic requirements of contract law so it becomes legally enforceable. And what the parties need to understand when entering into a cohabitation agreement is the nature of the agreement, that neither party has been under any duress to sign the agreement and that both parties acknowledge that by signing the agreement it becomes legally enforceable. A court is like more likely to uphold an agreement if all those principles have been followed and it should also take into consideration the needs of any future children. So when should you make a cohabitation agreement? A cohabitation agreement can be made at any time whether you're about to start living together or if you've been doing so for many years and why should you make one? The reason that you should make one is for, for what I've been talking about is that cohabitees do not acquire the same rights as married couples and there are no particular set of rules that apply if you split up from someone. So if you move into someone's property, as I've stated before, if your name is not on the title deed, you're not automatically going to acquire an interest. However, a cohabitation agreement can protect that. And that moves me into what you would include in a cohabitation agreement. This is your agreement, so you can include you know, what you want in this agreement. But the important points to include are your shared home, um, whether you know, how this is going to be held, who's paying the mortgage, if there are any endowment policies and insurance policies linked to the mortgage, what contributions are being made to those, what contributions are being paid made to, to paying bills, would you have a joint account, what contributions are made into that joint account, will the contributions be equal or not, or, or unequal. Um, so, there are factors that you would include. You can include things like personal possessions in the event of a separation. How would you split items such as furniture and cars? And, and you, you may pick, decide that you're both going to pick an item each if there's a dispute about personal possessions, but you can include all of that in a cohabitation agreement. So just to throw into the mix, if, if John and Jill were to break up and John has now met a new partner, but she wants to get married. She's got two children from a previous marriage and she's recently won the lottery. So she is she, she's married for the second time. She's got some wealth that she's built up, but she wants to protect this for the sake of her children. So she's going to have a prenuptial agreement drawn up. Um, so a prenuptial agreement is a legal agreement made between two individuals before their marriage has taken place. It sets out how they would want to divide their assets if they separate or divorce. Um, if you don't have a prenuptial agreement drawn up in these circumstances and you end up in divorce proceedings, it can be a costly process and a lengthy process and the court may not rely on, court may not rely, court will not rely on what you were saying at that point. It, if you've got a prenuptial agreement drawn up, it almost sets out the agreement that you'd reach, which would be taken into consideration if it's entered into correctly. So parties do need to consider what you would include in prenuptial agreement. And the starting point would be to look at what a court would look at within divorce proceedings. So a court in divorce proceedings would look at properties, lump sums, maintenance and pensions. And what the court would also take into consideration when looking at those assets is the income, earning capacity of the parties, financial need of the parties, standard of living enjoyed, the age of the spouses and whether there are any children and the financial needs of those children. Post-up agreements are shedding their stigma and becoming more popular. 
historically they didn't have any legal status in English law and that is because they had all they had been considered to be unfair however this is no longer the case and if they are entered into correctly and the agreement is a fair one it will hold evidential weight um, but they do have to be entered into by both parties freely with full appreciation of the consequences and very importantly it, it should not be allowed to prejudice the reasonable requirements of any children of the family so what you'd look at with the prenuptial agreement is if there are any children of the family born or circumstances do change then a prenuptial agreement should be reviewed periodically if it's considered to be unfair a court can overturn the agreement so you wouldn't really have an agreement where one party is getting everything and one party is getting nothing it does need to provide Re, uh, for the reasonable requirements of both parties and very often you can have a, a step to a step to arrangement so you could put in there that if you were to separate after a period of time the other party would get a certain sum of money and that would increase the longer the marriage uh, becomes um so the, there are certain conditions that need to be met to so that the agreement does have some weight um, so it shouldn't be unfair, which is what I've just gone through. Um, there should be full and frank disclosure between the parties so that there is some transparency about the assets that are available for division. The parties must have had independent legal advice and the purpose of having independent legal advice is so that both parties know what they're signing, know what they're entering into. And it must be signed at least 28 days before the wedding. And the reason for the 28 day period is so that there's no rush in signing it and it can't be said at a later date that one party didn't know what they were signing or they felt rushed into signing it so it shouldn't be left um, too late to sign the agreement so 28 days before the wedding so in summary and before I hand over to Helen um, the important points to note are if you are cohabiting think about entering into a cohabitation agreement with your partner if you're thinking of purchasing a home together take advice on how the property should be held if you're if you're marrying consider having a prenuptial agreement and if you're already married you can always consider a postnuptial agreement and the drafting of all of these documents to which I've referred can be complicated so it's best to seek our specialist advice. So now I'm going to hand over to Helen who um, is from our private client department. So over to you Helen. Oh thank you Sergio. Um, so yeah my name's Helen Jago um, I'm a private client solicitor specialising in estate planning and trusts. Um, in my part of the webinar, I'm going to be covering the topic of living together by focusing on the following sort of three areas. So how a trust deed can avoid financial headaches in the future. Um, common examples, just like Sergit's work through of how a trust deed or declaration of trust could work for you and um, safeguarding your partner or indeed other relatives um, by making a will. So the stamp duty land tax holiday, and um, perhaps, I don't know, the need to stay in your home during the, these various COVID lockdowns we've had over the last couple of years have resulted in somewhat of a house buying frenzy over the last few months. Um, certainly, I know for a fact that during the stamp duty land tax holiday, my convincing colleagues all saw unprecedented levels of house purchases. Um, and in my role as a private client solicitor, I've been asked to prepare an increasing number of trust deeds to go alongside such purchases. Studies have shown that the number of first time buyers is increasing. So in the tax year 1920, there was over 100,000 more first time buyers than in the year before, and this seems to be going up. And you might wonder um, how all these first time buyers could afford their first home these days with house prices so high. Um, and the answer perhaps might lie partly in the emerging bank of mum and dad. Um, as you can see on the slide, according to a 2020 study by Legal and General, 49% of first time buyers aged under 35 had help from parents, aka bank of mum and dad, to buy a property in 2020. And on average, the bank of mum and dad is lending or gifting £20,000. And often what we come across is that the family is happy to give the money to their own child, um, but they might not be so willing for this to be shared with a cohabiting partner, especially if they should split from their child in the future. 
And one way to ring fence such gifts from parents or indeed unequal contributions from the parties themselves is to put in place a trust deed setting out the ownership split from the outset. Um, and often gifting par parents may want to encourage their offspring to protect their early inheritance in this way. So Sergit touched on cohabitation agreements, which is obviously um, a bit more comprehensive and covers lots of areas such as bank accounts, pensions, the property itself. The trustee tends to just focus on, on the property. So what is a trust deed or a declaration of trust? And there are many forms of trust, um, either during a lifetime or in wills, but I'm going to focus on the situation where an unmarried couple purchase a property as their main residence to live in, and I come across this a lot. I'm also going to consider the situation where a property is purchased in the name of one party or already owned by one party, but they want to legally recognise the rights of their cohabiting partner by declaring that they hold their property on trust for both of them. So they may well do that in a cohabitation agreement like Sergix um, touched on, or they may want to do just focus on the property in, in a trust deed. The term declaration of trust and trust deed are often used interchangeably, and really there's little practical difference between them. Um, but as you can see from the slide, I've just sort of put the basics there, that the trust deed is a legally binding document which just sets out the terms of the trust between the parties. It's more commonly referred to as a declaration of trust, where like perhaps one owner declares that they hold the asset on trust, and, and both are legally binding. So I'm just going to move on to um, the next slide now, um, and we're going to look at an example involving, this time we've got James and Sarah. They're going to buy their first house together, and let's say that's £350,000. So James has saved a deposit of £45,000, and Sarah is going to be gifted £25,000 from her mum and dad. So this was the bank her mum and dad we're talking about. The balance of £280,000 is going to be funded by a mortgage. The hope will be for James and Sarah that assuming the equity in the property increases, they will both get back their deposits and they're also going to share um, equally the equity in years to come. So in that case, um, we might structure the trustee to set out that the mortgage will be redeemed first from the net sale proceeds. We could say the next sum of 70,000 being their combined deposits is split 45,000 pounds to James representing his deposit and £25,000 to Sarah, representing her deposit, which she got from her parents. This could be reduced pro rata in the hopefully rare event that the equity is actually less when they sell than when they purchase. And then the trustee could say that the balance is split equally 50-50 between the two of them. So that's one way they could structure the tr trust deed. Um, an alternative might have been for them to turn their initial contributions and their half shares of the mortgage contributions into a percentage figure. And this would mean that James would receive a bigger percentage overall as his initial deposit will grow as the property prices increase or decrease if the property price is full. And the manner in which the trustee is agreed at the outset can significantly alter the figures which each party, James and Sarah, will receive back in years to come. And therefore, I always suggest to clients that they crunch through the figures and the different calculations to ensure that they are making an informed decision from the outset as to what the ownership split will be moving forwards. So do they just want to ring fence what they've put in and then split everything else equally? Or is James looking perhaps for a, uh, for a bigger share because he's put in a bigger amount at the start? So I'm going to move on to another example now um, for Bill and Ruby this time. And this is similar again to a, a scenario that um, Sergit referred to. And this might be that Bill has owned his own home, um, which let's say is worth £500,000 for several years. And he meets Ruby and after six months, Ruby moves in. Bill currently has an outstanding mortgage of £350,000. Ruby is sadly unable to be added to the mortgage because she's got a poor credit history, but is now working and she can pay towards the mortgage. And Bill quite likes this. He's in love with Ruby and he, you know, he wants her to move in and he wants to recognise her rights. 
Ruby has savings of £50,000, perhaps she might have got an inheritance, say, which she wishes to invest into Bill's property and which would allow Bill to pay off some of the mortgage early to save a bit of interest. So Bill and Ruby have agreed that going forward, they're going to share the mortgage repayments and even the utility bills. In this case, Bill needs to consider that before he prepares any documents granting Ruby a beneficial share in the property, Bill will need to check with the mortgage company that they do not object to him declaring that he holds the property on trust for himself and Ruby. Remember, Ruby can't go on the legal title because um, the mortgage company won't allow it. She's not got great credit history, um, but he wants to make sure she's got a beneficial interest. So um, we need to just check the terms of the mortgage that that's not going to be an issue. And the declaration of trust will most likely need to make it clear that the rights of the mortgage company come first, even before Ruby's rights, so that the mortgage company is not prejudiced by Ruby's now involvement in the property. So moving on to the next slide, assuming the mortgage terms allow Bill to put in place a trust deed, Bill creates a declaration of trust declaring that he holds the property on trust as to 60% for Bill and 40% for Ruby. And we'll just drill down how this might be worked out. So let's take Bill had original equity of £150,000 and he's now agreed with Ruby that he will be equally liable for the mortgage with her, meaning he's going to be responsible for the three, for 150,000 of the total um, 300,000 mortgage, which is left after Ruby's repaid some of it, um, making Bill's total contribution at this point in time, 300,000 um, pounds. 300,000 out of the total value of the property of 500,000 equals a 60% share for Bill. The trust would also need to make it clear that from this 60% is deducted half of the mortgage at any one time because that's what they've agreed. And Ruby's share will be calculated in a similar way. So she will be putting in a contribution of 50,000. Remember, she's paying off a bit of the mortgage and she's agreed, hasn't she, to be responsible for half the remaining mortgage of 150,000. So this gives Ruby's total contribution of £200,000, which amounts to 40% of the total value. And again, the trust would state that Ruby's share um, has to have deducted from it half of the mortgage from time to time. And this means that as they both pay off the mortgage equally, there will be less mortgage to deduct from each of their respective shares. And that's just one way that Ruby and Bill might structure that, you know, that trust deed or declaration of trust. Um, another option might have been for Bill and Ruby to ring fence their contributions. So 150,000 for Bill, 50,000 for Ruby, and then split the equity equally. So a little bit like in the James and Sarah example um, we've just covered. Either way, it would need to be clear who would be responsible for any shortfall in the mortgage if the equity was insufficient to repay in full um, before um, Bill and Ruby get their sort of um, contributions back. And further, the trust should clarify whether if Ruby's 40% share of the equity is insufficient to repay the 50% of the mortgage at the time of the sale, then Obviously, at that point, bill share is going to have to repay the shortfall because the mortgage has got to be repaid. But would Ruby be liable to bill from her own other funds, perhaps, to make up that shortfall that's now come out of his 60% share? All those sort of things need to perhaps be squared off from the outset in a trust deed. So as well as the substantive part of the trust deed, setting out the extent of the ownership shares between the co-owners, it's also important to ensure that other matters are addressed within the trust itself. So we've sort of seen some of them. So for example, who's gonna pay the mortgage? Will both parties contribute equally? Um, perhaps they'll own a 70, 30% share and pay the mortgage on a 70, 30 split as well. In which case you literally just say 70% for Bob, 30% for Bill, that's fine. Um, perhaps one party will make all the mortgage repayments from their share. So, for example, you could have um, James uh, has half the property, but from that is deducted the whole mortgage and Sarah has the other half um, 
and there's no mortgage deducted from her share because that's just the way they've bought yeah they've, ju they've just structured things so in any event the mortgage arrangement should be made clear in the trustee where possible from the outset so another matter you might wish to address in the trust aid, which we commonly do when we draft them, is what happens if one party wants out of the arrangement? What you don't want is one party sitting there and refusing to move. So it's often a good idea to include rights of preemption so that either party wishing to remain in the property has a certain period of time, a sort of right of first refusal to buy the other party out. And otherwise, perhaps if neither party wishes to buy the other out, you could state in the trustee that in that case, the property should be sold after so many months. It's just setting that framework from the outset. Um, likewise, it could um, confirm that if one party share of the property is to be sold to the other co-owner, how is that share going to be valued? Is there any discount because it's a share or is it just market value? What happens if they can't agree on the market value? Um, all of that can be covered off in, in a properly drafted trust deed. The trustee, similar to cohabitation agreement, may also set up who will be responsible for the utility bills, the maintenance of the property. So not massive renovations, that's that sort of a capital expenditure, but the sort of uh, outgoings like maintenance, buildings, insurance, council tax. And these can run into thousands of pounds over time um, and so should be considered. So in addition, a trust deed itself is not mentioned on the title deeds at the land registry. So there can be a risk that a trustee can be forgotten or overlooked, and that might be overlooked deliberately or quite innocently. Um, memories can even fade. People may even forget they've done a trust deed when it's done with so much paperwork at the time of their purchase. And so to avoid this, it's often advisable to arrange for restrictions to be put on the title deeds. And a common example of a co-ownership restriction might say there's to be no sale of that property unless the terms of the trust deed have been complied with. And this just flags up to the parties and any future conveyancer that they'll need to consider the trust before the sale progresses, as that's going to set out how those sale proceeds will ultimately be split. It is worth noting that a trustee can be updated at any time by agreement by all the parties. So, for example, with our Bill and Ruby um, case study, if Ruby was later in a position to invest further sums, the parties may agree that from that time they will simply hold the property in equal shares. And that's absolutely fine, as long as they both agree ahead of Ruby putting in the additional contributions. Ideally, well, and certainly advisably, Bill and Ruby should create another trust deed just recording that new, more simpler, simpler agreement. Tying into what Sergit covered earlier, um, from a family point of view, please note that a matrimonial court may not always uphold the terms of a trust deed when making a financial order if the parties get married and then divorced. So again, if we look at Bill and Ruby and the 60-40 split, the trustee may well be good evidence of their contributions and intention at the start of the period of cohabitation. However, if Bill and Ruby are married for years and maybe even have children together, a matrimonial court may decide to make a different award to the parties as it sees fit in the circumstances. It may not uphold that 60-40 split that they agreed as a young couple before they got married. Um, and as mentioned by my colleague Sergi, a prenuptial agreement might be a good idea in that case. Um, so if Bill and Ruby consider marriage, then they could consider a, pre a prenuptial agreement. So some parties will think, well, you know, so what? What happens if we haven't got a trustee? Do we actually need one? Um, and what I would say is if there's no trust in place, there are more likely to be problems ascertaining what each party's share of the property is worth if either they split up or if one of them passes away. So with the best intentions in the world, memories do fail. So as you will have seen by just the two examples mentioned above, there are actually several ways in which the trust in either case could be structured. And over time, with property prices increasing over the years, or indeed if there's a sudden property market crash, 
it can make a real difference, for example, whether a fixed sum is ring fenced or percentages are worked out, or what happens if, if, if the mortgage is greater um, than the equity in the property. Without a trustee, the parties may quite genuinely forget what they agreed, or indeed, perhaps more commonly, is they might never have even put their mind to it in the first place. And if the agreement isn't recorded in a clear and appropriately worded trust deed, then hopefully all of that doesn't become an issue because you can always just refer back to it. So in light of the above, if there's no trust deed or indeed a badly worded unprofessional trust deed or where couples have just sort of scribbled their thoughts down, there's perhaps a lot more likely to be a dispute over what was agreed at the start and perhaps many years ago. And such disputes are costly and they're stressful for the parties. So to avoid this, it's recommended a trust is put in place prior to exchange of contracts. Um, once exchange has taken place, remember the parties are committed um, to purchase and then they may struggle to agree over the terms of the trust. And I've often seen cases where couples have thought they're on the same page, but when we just drill down a little further with the figures, they have in fact both been presuming something quite different to each other. Um, so it is important to reach an acceptable agreement that both parties are happy with at the outset, and hopefully that will then much reduce the chance of a later dispute. Where one party is putting in a larger share, if they haven't got a trust deed, then the event of a breakdown in the relationship, if both parties are on the deeds, on the face of things, they're going to own that property equally. Um, and as Sergey also touched on, that's going to be a costly and uphill struggle to then try and argue that, in fact, the party is entitled to a larger share in the property if things later go sour. OK, so people often ask me, well, I've done a trust deed, so why do I need a will? Or they might say, I've done a will, why do I need a trust deed? Um, and in fact, there are two separate, equally important documents that fulfil entirely separate jobs. So in summary, a trust deed sets out the ownership proportions whilst you are alive. So in the Bill and Ruby example, we knew that Bill had a 60% share in the property from which will be deducted 50% of the mortgage outstanding at any time. He would know what share he would receive if he splits from Ruby during his lifetime. Further, if he dies, his executors could look at the trustee and know what share of the property is to form part of Bill's estate. The will, on the other hand, confirms who gets the share of the property when you have passed away. So who will get Bill's 60% share of the property when he passes away? And without a will, if people own the property as tenants in common with each other, which will always be the case if there's a trustee setting out the ownership shares or in any case where you're not beneficial joint tenants, which Sergio explained earlier, then your partner will receive nothing under the intestacy provisions. Um, the intestacy provisions, what are they? They are rules which set out who receives your estate if you pass away without a will. And it's really important just to note that a cohabiting couple, if they're unmarried, they are not on the intestacy rules list at all. So if you want your cohabiting partner to receive your share of the property when you pass away, you must put in place a will. So in Bill's case, the trust would set out that he owns 60%. His will might confirm that he leaves that 60% to Ruby on his death. Otherwise, it's going to pass to family, not necessarily in the order that he wants under the intestacy rules. Another situation might be that actually you don't want your property to pass outright to your cohabiting partner. Um, for example, Bill might have a son from a previous relationship who he ultimately wishes to receive his 60% share, but he does want to make sure perhaps that Ruby lives in the residence rent free for the rest of her life. And again, he must put in place a will setting out how that arrangement might work. There might be another trust actually in the will saying Ruby's got the right to living in his beneficial share for the rest of her life, but ultimately is going to pass to his son. So in summary, when you're purchasing a property together, especially for the first time 
or if contributions are massively unequal, then you should consider putting in place a trust deed recording your ownership or a cohabitation agreement and also put in place a will confirming what will happen to your share if either of you pass away. If you are going to get married, uh, then consider a prenuptial um, and all of these work side by side to each other. So I hope that's given you a really brief overview between me and Sergio of the most typical um, cohabitation situations and the documents you might need to put in place. And I'm now going to pass you back to um, Jo to raise any questions she might have received in the, in the, in the Q&A while I've been talking. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, Sergit. Thank you very much, Helen. That was uh, in incredibly informative. Um, I hope uh, everybody got something to take away from that. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Um, one, um, I think, for Sergit initially. Um, if if you're living with somebody um, who and, and you're the sole owner of the property and the person that you're living with um, let's say, does some renovation of the property and pays for them, et cetera. Do, do they have any claim at that point that they've made a contribution to improving the property? Yeah, I mean, it, what it'd have to do, is have, it would have to add some value to the property. And then you'd be looking at a resulting trust. So you would consider that a direct contribution made to the property. So you wouldn't consider something like sh shopping or paying bills or, you know, decorating a room as a direct contribution but if you're doing extensive renovation works um and you're contributing towards those then you would be arguing that you've got that's a resulting trust and that you would be claiming an interest in the property on on that basis okay thank you um and i have another question here which i think is more for for helen um if um is it easier to to challenge a will when a couple are living together um, so let's let's say, for example, they've they've got children, they decide to live together, but they decide not to get married um, and make a will. Do, do, is, it, is it easier to actually dispute that? Um, no. So if, if the will is legally um, is valid, it's all been signed correctly. Um, the testator was of sound mind when they made that will, then everyone is really stuck with that will. Uh, the only option in that situation, if they haven't made a will for their cohabiting partner, is, um, you know, they haven't passed anything to them, is for that cohabiting partner to make a claim under the Inheritance Provision for Family and Dependence Act um, 1975, which is really costly, really stressful. It might be they can come to some kind of settlement with the family under the will, but it's not easy at all. It really is important that if you're cohabiting, you want your partner to get something, you, you absolutely you must make a will yeah okay all right well that brings us uh, bang on time thank you very much to the end of our webinar today as i said uh, we are going to uh, we have been recording this we will make a copy available on demand on the website later and on our social media channels um, thanks very much helen thanks very much sergit and obviously if uh, anybody would like to contact either helen or sergit visit the website at palmerslaw.co.uk uh, and you can contact them directly um, thank you very much